Hey everyone, welcome to a spooky Halloween edition of the Dan and Joe Sports Show. As always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. All right, Joe, this uh, Halloween edition, of course, is going to be our locker room talk, and it's brought to you by our fine sponsors, um, Beach Ball Properties. Uh, a little bit cold now, but you know I'm sure it'll warm up in just a week or so if you're looking for maybe a little bit of a more wintry beach trip give hunter and ginger a call at beach ball properties and go have a ball at the beach down in orange beach or gulf shores sounds um, good joe we had the final four reveal last night on halloween uh and you know i've always found that kind of interesting they do that because i feel like your viewership has got to be very low but that made me think with it being halloween last night you getting the final four uh results put out for the initial college football playoff uh rankings uh made me think what are my four favorite halloween movies uh you know as you could see by my skeleton hands and the fact that i'm born in october i love halloween in fact my 35th birthday which uh you were at joe did a halloween themed party and you know made the costumes my favorite 35 movies and tv shows that are you know, just just in general, not necessarily Halloween ones. So I thought, why don't I do my four favorite Halloween movies? This is tough, Joe, because I love Halloween. So there's a lot of really good movies going on. But I do have to say that, you know, while the committee, I'm sure, had to think a lot last night when they came up with Ohio State as their number one team, my number one pick for Halloween movie was not even close. Uh, this is probably like a top five favorite movie period for me. and. I, it's definitely the most well done Halloween movie I've ever seen. The acting in it is incredible. Uh, visually, it's just stunning, and it's a great story. And one might say it's the original Halloween story, and that, of course, is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Of course, it's based based off the the fantastic book Bram Stoker's Dracula, which led to basically every single vampire thing you've ever seen. All down the line, Twilight, Lost Boys, you name it. It all comes from it, including Nosferatu, which was pretty much the first horror movie. And the first vampire movie was basically a ripoff of Bram Stoker's Dracula. The one that I like, though, Joe, is the one from 1993 that has Gary Oldman as Dracula in it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he's just an incredible actor. And he plays bad guys, like, so well. And I actually watched it earlier this week. And I mean, it's just it's just really a beautiful movie. Like the way they do even the love story of him uh, kind of through time almost uh, trying to get Elizabetha, who ends up being Mina later on, uh, played by Winona Ryder. Uh, you know, you have him, of course, uh, Jonathan Harker in this one is Keanu Reeves. Um, you have Anthony Hopkins is Van Helsing. And of course, Anthony Hopkins, as always, just excellent. And it's just it's just really awesome. And you don't see many horror movies that are directed by Francis Ford Coppola, who of course directed The Godfather. Mm -hmm. um, and just you know, it's just a, it's just a really great movie. And for anybody that hasn't seen it, you know, watch it and tell me it's not incredible. Yeah, so they, they make bad guys look good, I guess. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's one where you definitely find yourself very sympathetic to the, the main bad guy in it. I got you. So that's that's my number one. Um, number two, I like this movie a lot, and I actually started it last night a little bit. But this one, uh, it's more for you know the effect it's had on Halloween in general, and kind of an ode to it. And that's Hocus Pocus. I mean, you think about it; it's set in Salem, Massachusetts, which, at least by America standards, is the most uh, Halloween-friendly city in all of the U.S. I was up there in October once for my thirtieth birthday. And I mean, I've never seen a place that was so decked out for Halloween, like everything, all the shops, all the houses. Uh, we met some people up there. My wife and I did that said that their kids get four different Halloween outfits every single year because, I mean, really, they're just doing trick or treating and Halloween related activities for the entire month. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people, you know, it's the witch city, right? It's where the Salem witch trials happen. And all of the municipal workers, the cops, the uh, the firefighters, they all have the Witch City emblem. And so it's kind of funny to see someone like a police officer wearing a little, you know, emblem that's got the witch on it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that uh, that movie just gives a, an ode to it. Like it has, yeah. you know, it has all the scenes from that. The entire movie's filmed there. And it's just it's just a, it's a cool movie. 
Yeah, I remember when that movie uh, came out, like being like, I guess, uh, four or five years old. And it was kind of the, the same year, I think, the Sandlot came out. So it's kind of a kind of a cool year of uh, nostalgia. And uh, one of the trivia uh, uh, questions or points I've seen about the movie before or read about it. It's so apparently, uh, who is the main uh, like young boy that's in the movie? The character, is it Max? Is that his name? Yeah, I think, I think it's Max, yeah. So Max apparently was uh, at one point going to be played by uh, Leonardo D- uh, DiCaprio. Really? He would have uh-huh. been in that role. Yeah, so apparently I just I think he just turned it down or just didn't work out at the last minute, and so th- th- this is the way it worked out. That's an interesting fact, Joe. I didn't know that. He would have been excellent in that role because, I mean, for anybody that hasn't seen DiCaprio when he was a child actor, he was excellent. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you look at Basketball Diaries, What's Eating Gilbert Grape. I mean, he was someone that just had it from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, Joe, my number three, I kind of flip-flop on this one a little bit, um, but I got to go for my number three, The Shining. I love the movie. Uh, recently, we went up to see a friend of the show, Chelsea, up in Nashville, and she took us to this pop-up bar that they had in Nashville, this, this really cool hotel that they call... Uh, the Hotel Noel, and it's always got different times of the year. It has like different kinds of themed bars. And for their Halloween one, they had a shining themed bar, and it was so cool. I mean, you walk in the front, everything's kind of got the red with the blood. Uh, they go into like an old school room, and you see like the two little girls kind of standing there. Um, and they had you know the typewriter where it has the all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. They had the area to where you know. You had the axe and through the door, you can kind of look through and do your here's Johnny. And it's just one of those movies that no matter how old it gets, and right now we're looking at it's over 40 years old, it just always is scary. And, mm-hmm. you know, one thing like about a lot of horror movies is a lot of times you don't necessarily have the best acting in it or really the best like screenwriting. But this is one that kind of like, uh, you know, what I'll mention with Bram Stoker's Dracula you got the killer acting. You have an amazing director, uh, Stanley Kubrick, who, of course, uh, directed, um, I think he directed Apocalypse Now. He directed um, uh, Full Metal Jacket. It's also a really good movie. Uh, you know, all kinds of movies that, that he did. Um, you know, this is probably the most iconic acting, I think, of any movie in a horror role by Jack Nicholson, uh, playing Jack Torrance in it. And, I mean... You know, everybody's seen the Here's Johnny, uh, you know, just him doing all of his little kind of like ad libs. And there's some cool things on Twitter I've seen lately where I guess they were kind of filming the filming of the movie. And I actually was watching one right before this episode started where it was showing uh, Jack Nicholson getting prepared for the act scene. And it was wow. really neat. So you got to kind of see his method, like how he gets into the role right there to just be such an intense character. Mm-hmm. Kind of that, that origination. Mm-hmm. And there's also there was another one I saw from a while back where it shows Stanley Kubrick uh filming from below the scene where uh where Jack gets uh gets locked in the freezer at the hotel and like his you know his his anger and talking to his wife from below. And it was really cool to see that this you know big time director was doing some of the shots himself. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I could totally see that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a huge Stephen King fan. So I've read, I've read The Shining, the book, and I've also read the sequel to it, uh, Dr. Sleep, which is also really good. And there's a movie with that too that had Ewan McGregor in it uh, that came out a few years ago. It was also a, a solid movie. Wow. Um, and then, Joe, number four, it's one that I haven't seen in a while. But when you I look at it, it's kind of importance to Halloween in general. And it's the eponymous title, Joe. It's Halloween itself. Uh, it started all the slasher movies. Uh, they all originated from Halloween. You know, everybody sees the Michael Myers masks all the time. Uh, this is the movie that brought uh, Jamie Lee Curtis uh, to America's uh, eyes and, you know, led to her career that's now been 45 years old. And I actually recently saw her, I think this year, win her first Oscar. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like shocking when you think about it that it took her that long to win one. Yeah. But, you know, basically all of the movies where you have the character that goes around with a knife and kills people who 
seems like it no matter what you do to him, he doesn't die. That kind of started with Michael Myers. Mm-hmm. Kind of, kind of got, set the precedent for a lot of other movies. It did. Plus, it has the music that, like, you can't ever forget. Dun, 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 dun. Like, you know, that, that stuff just kind of gets stuck in your head. Mm-hmm. I could see that. Oh, another thing, too, Joe, I, I don't know if this trope existed before that movie, but this is also the one where I felt like if you were a teenager and you were engaging in premarital sex, that's where you got killed. I'm pretty sure that started in Halloween. I'm not, I never, and that, that's something that like exists in like pretty much any kind of like Halloween um, horror movie since then. Pretty sure Halloween started that one too. And did you say that? Now that's your fourth. Uh, you well, said that's number that's number four right there. Um, okay. You know, just like when we have the playoff rankings, you got the teams too that like kind of come in just outside of it. If there was going to be some movement, I'll put some honorable mention movies out there, too, that, like, would be in that five through eight role. Um, The Lost Boys is one of my all-time favorite movies. It's a vampire movie from the 80s, basically for the 80s, because you get Corey Corey Feldman's in it and all the big-time 80s stars, and it's got the music and just kind of the whole atmosphere. Um, uh, What's his name? The guy who plays Jack Bauer is in it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's just a it's a solid movie for anyone that likes kind of hokey eighties movies, which I do. Um, I put The Exorcist also in my honorable mention. It's a tough movie. It's not one you can watch very much. I mean, it truly is one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. Um, I actually watched one that is a newer one that had Russell Crowe in it. It was called The Last Exorcist. That's based on a real story of someone who was actually the the Pope's exorcist, like the number one exorcist in all of the Catholic religion. And it was it was pretty good. I mean, it, it was a good movie, but like, you know, that's a movie even that probably wouldn't have been had anybody care about it if it wasn't for the original exorcist from back in the 70s. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Um Joey, you know, uh, I had to put Casper on there because that was a movie that I watched all the time when I was a kid. And when I think about like kind of Disney Halloween movies, it and Cocos Pocus are just kind of right there together. Right. Neck and neck. And I mean, you know, Casper has that kind of thing where every time you see kind of an old uh, Queen Anne style house, I think of Casper. I was like, that's a Casper house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I can totally see that. And I think that's set what it mean. I think so. That sounds right to me. It definitely looks like a house you can see in Maine. Uh, to be honest, in Mobile, there's a house that I always think of. It's like a Casper house that's on Government Street. There's this crazy Queen Anne house that, you know, if it's not haunted, then I would be shocked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I, I, I can see that. And in, in houses like that have always kind of kind of interested me. And so, yeah, I, I, I totally get that. Yeah, and as someone that lives in a house that's over 100 years old, not haunted, knock on wood, uh, <laughs> I always find like old houses like that kind of cool. I mean, I like that I get to live in an old house. Right, absolutely. And Joe, the last one that I had, and this is one that there'd have to be a huge paradigm shift to make the playoff, but hey, you know, never you never know, is paranormal activity. And I like paranormal activity a lot because – of the way it's done. I mean, it's a really interesting like style to it where it's almost like you're, you're basing it off of video cameras inside of someone's house and the budget of it. I mean, it was a movie that I think was made on a budget of $10,000 and they shot it in like under two weeks. And it's of course, you know, now there's like what seven or eight paranormal activities. I think it's netted in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And in terms of ROI, it might be the greatest movie of all time. That's quite a um, a growth there. That's right. All right, Joe. So now we've talked about the Halloween Final Four. Let's look at the actual Final Four that we came out last night. Uh, we came out with number one, Ohio State. Number two, Georgia. Uh, number three uh, was Michigan. And then number four was Florida State. And, you know, I can't really dispute the teams that made it. Uh, now the order of it. You could, you know, that's kind of up for debate. Uh, it's when you look at Ohio State and Georgia, Joe, that's a question of do you go based on eye test or on resume? Because I don't think there's any doubt that you could say right now that in terms of resume, you either have to go with Ohio State or Florida State. And I do agree that Ohio State has a little bit better of a resume. Yeah, I think that's what they did. 
and I was looking back at Ohio State's schedule, and they really, like you said with the eye test, they haven't really had a game to me where they just looked ultra, ultra impressive. They've had you know, some close calls, obviously, against great opponents like uh, a Notre Dame, for instance, and uh, Penn State even, you know, a 20-12 to 12 win in that game. But I-, I was a little bit surprised to see them number one. I think I personally thought it was going to be Georgia, you know, just kind of based on the last two years. Yeah, Joe, and, and I think it's interesting that they took that stand to not put Georgia at number one, despite the fact they're back-to-back national champions, and they really have lately – kind of dominated people and they did it last week without Brock Bowers and, and a huge win over Florida. Um, but what's interesting to me though, is every year, you know, the committee has a different thing they kind of focus on that they say. And then ultimately you see things that are kind of hypocritical. Cause in my mind, if you're saying that Ohio state is the number one team, because look at what they've done, then how is Florida state not number two? No, that's a good point. And really, looking at the AP top 25, they did it how I would have done it. Like, they have Georgia number one. I would have put Michigan probably number two. Ohio State three and Florida State four. Of course, I'm basing it somewhat off off the eye test. But at the end of the day, I thought that the metrics, you know, if you're going to have a committee, the eye test would be a component. Like, I thought, you know, you, you look at what the committee did here, you would almost think that they ran it through the machines. And that's that's exactly what it looks like. Um, you know, with Michigan, they're on the on the field. They look like the most impressive team in America, but they just haven't played anybody. And a lot of that, I think, is completely their fault. I mean, they're they're on non conference schedules. A joke. At least with Georgia, they were going to play Oklahoma this year, but I think the SEC was the one who canceled it. A lot of people have been trying to give Georgia a bunch of hell about the fact that they didn't play Oklahoma. But, in fact, that was the SEC that canceled it because of the fact that Oklahoma is coming to the league next year. Interesting. I wonder why they didn't cancel then Alabama, Texas. I know. I was wondering the same thing. Uh, you know, now maybe, I, maybe I've been listening to too many Georgia people about that, but that was my understanding of how it happened. But you're right. Why would Oklahoma – why would Alabama and Texas not have therefore also been canceled? Yeah, this is definitely an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think Michigan, I want to say, had somebody like UCLA on their schedule and that they paid them to get off of it for some reason. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there is – there was somebody that was big like that, that it was a USC, UCLA, one of those teams out in California that they had canceled a couple of years ago, and now Michigan's sitting where they are. Um, I got to say, Joe, I am kind of happy that they didn't just leave Michigan out of the top four. I know you have all of this Connor Stallions – you know, the, the Jim Harbaugh and trauma, uh, you know, uh, issues right now and and scandal. But in my mind, I, I don't see how that, that shouldn't affect the way you value this team. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think you had to, to do it the way the way you're doing it. And, you know, on, on the field, you know, we've seen what we've, we've seen. And so, I, yeah, I mean, I, they absolutely had to be in the top four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I still think I know a lot of people thought, well, why isn't Washington the top four based on their win against Oregon at home? That's a great win. Don't get me wrong. And Oregon looks like a fantastic team. These are the teams that are sitting there at five and six, respectively, with Washington at five, Oregon at six. But what Florida State did, and not just beating LSU, but obliterating them, is much more impressive to me than you having a lit home atmosphere and winning a game against Oregon that, frankly, you probably should have lost. Mm -hmm. And Washington's had a lot of close calls, too, or or games where they have looked a little bit underwhelming the last few weeks. Yeah, I mean, and now you could say the same thing about Florida State, but it does seem like they've righted the ship a little bit and been a little bit more impressive lately. Mm -hmm. I think so. But, I mean, the good news is if you're Washington or Oregon, I think either one of you, if you went out, you're probably in – and maybe Washington could drop a game to someone like USC this weekend, and if they were able to still go through and win the Pac-12 and then beat Oregon again, presumably they probably could still get in, I think. I think they would, but it looks like it's setting up for Oregon-Washington, and I, I would expect Oregon to probably win that rematch. I think so, too. I, mean, I think the only reason that, that Oregon lost that game, uh, there was some bad coaching moves by Dan Lanning, but I think it really was the the Washington home atmosphere is a very underrated one. Oh yes, yes, absolutely in Seattle. 
So, you know, looking outside of it, uh, you know, you have Texas at number seven, uh, Oklahoma at number eight. You know, I still think – I think Texas still has a chance. I'm a little iffy about whether I think Oklahoma can get back into it after what I can only be termed an embarrassing loss. Yeah, that was a shocker. Uh, I know we'll talk about more about it in just a few minutes, but yeah, that, that, that was a shock. But I, I think that – I feel like everybody that's kind of in that top 11 or 12, you know, has a puncher's chance. But, you know, with all the – with five undefeated teams – you know, there's only going to be so much traction. Right. I mean, and of course, you know, Alabama sitting there at number nine, or I think Alabama's at, yeah, Alabama's at nine and Ole Miss is at 10. I think those are teams also that are, that are there and have a, a possibility. Um, you know, LSU, I think got in at 14 and they're the only team that has two losses that I think has any chance at all. And of course they'd have to win out, but, I, I would be interested to see what would happen to a team like LSU that they took the risk to go out and play a great team like Florida State in the non-conference. Uh, if you go out and you win the SEC, then you'll have beaten Alabama, you'll have beaten Georgia, uh, Texas A&M, um, you know, Missouri. They're going to have a lot of really quality wins right there. So that would be another one that I'd be interested in because if we remember back to 2017, Auburn was a two-loss team who – took the risk and play in a really great Clemson team in the non-conference, then be back-to-back number ones in Georgia and Alabama and going into the SEC championship game, Auburn was ranked the number two team in the country. I know it's a different makeup, but I, there's, there's precedent that LSU could be considered. I think they would, uh, you know, more than likely. They might need a little help, you know, with some of the teams losing in front of them. That's probably going to work itself out. And additionally, you had that precedent at LSU back in 27, of course, for the VCS, but, you know, they won a national title with two losses. And so it, it has worked out for this school uh, conveniently before. That's right. Well, when we get back, we're going to talk about all the big games coming up this weekend and recapping ones like the uh, the Oklahoma and Kansas Stunner and, of course, the upcoming Bama and LSU game. I want to wish everyone a happy Halloween and thank you for listening. And I hope you had quite the All Hallows Eve. Uh, you can catch all their episodes on Spotify, including the spooky ones. You can uh, get, see us in live and living color on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Dan and Joe Sports Show YouTube channel. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at DJ Sports Show and like our Facebook fan page. And as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe.